And in keeping with our theme, I'd like to tell you a true story. And I'd like you to join with me as we visit a community, one with just dirt paths crisscrossing the terrain, sort of like ivy growing up the side of an old building. And picture thousands of squatters living in this maze, stepping over ruts that are filled with gray sewage. In the middle of this catacomb stands a, a single small community center. No curtains over the screenless windows, no carpeting on the concrete floor, no furniture whatsoever. 25 women are already seated on the floor when we arrive. And they're speaking in Hindi, updating each other on the progress and problems of their little enterprises, leaving us cross-legged on that hard floor. And through our interpreter, Solomon, who's also the director of Opportunities Work in India, our clients report what they have accomplished together. And I learned a lot that day about the transforming power of community. I, I can sense their pride as they start telling me how they brought electricity to their village. For years, they had survived with no access to power. And out of desperation, many of them had availed themselves of service by pirating wires from their home up to one lone utility pole. And these were no union electricians. These were squatters who would cut open the wire and splice into this already spliced splice, and each time letting those wires droop just a little lower. And the top of that pole looked like an upended bowl of angel hair spaghetti with dozens of strands going in every direction. And when the parents would hear their kids out there playing, they'd be afraid that one of them might touch those wires, or a ball kicked too high could spring the whole tangle loose, spreading those electric currents down into the kids below. And for years, they tried to get electric service to their community. And finally, the members of this little group wrote a petition. And they called the local newspaper, who came out and took a picture of that poll and published an article about the dangerous plight of these squatters. And within short order, the city came out and ran electric wires to each little hovel in that home, in that village. And that day when I was there, those women proudly unfolded this little yellow tattered newspaper clipping complete with photograph and celebrated all over again what they had accomplished. Because the power of community brought power to their community. But that's not all. Community doesn't just build up the group. It builds up every individual within that group. And I'd like to tell you about the transformation of one young woman, Manika, about 25 years old, who was elected by the other members of her group to be their spokesperson. Because on the day that we were there, they were going to ask for more credit so they could expand their businesses. And she was to be their voice. And in no time, cheered on by her sorority, Manika and Solomon were engaged in a lively discussion that uh, went something like this. Uh, this is Manika. <clears throat> our group needs the next round of credit, and we'd like larger loans so we can expand our businesses. And Solomon. I'm sorry, but as you know, the next disbursement cannot be made until all the loans are paid off. Well, except for just two members. Everybody has paid back the money they borrowed, plus the interest. Well, that's commendable, but not good enough. Are you forgetting what it means to cross-guarantee each other's loans? No one gets more credit until all the debts are paid in full. Well, we understand the requirement, but you know what happened. One of the ladies borrowed milk and bought a milk cow, and the cow died. Oh, that's regrettable. But you remember, we strongly encouraged her to use part of her loan to insure her cow. Well, she didn't, and now the cows died. And without any milk to sell, how do you possibly expect her to pay back her loan? And 
I sat there on that floor for about 15 minutes, listening to that debate going on. And when it was done, Solomon took me aside and said how delighted he was with that heated exchange because less than two years ago when Monika first came into his office and asked for a loan, she could not even look him in the eye. And her self-confidence allowed her to only gaze at the floor, unable to stand erect or hold her head up. How different from the poised and confident person I met that day. In the developing world where there are no safety nets, community empowers the most disenfranchised people. And it gives them confidence and inspires them to do what they would otherwise fail to, to, to try. And it gives the poor what life insurance and health insurance and a long list of my possessions provide me. And as I evaluate community in the third world, and I see its unstoppable force, I realize how impoverished I am. Despite our affluence in our society, wealth robs us of community, which we exchange for independence and mobility and opulence. And we build walls around our homes to protect our possessions and our privacy. Meanwhile, on the inside, we're crying out to be known and to know others more deeply. And what's missing in our relationships is the freedom to depend on others. And we've come to view freedom as the antithesis of dependency. And in Manika's village, they share resources, they barter services, they exchange favors as a way of life. And in my suburb in Chicago, I'm so self-contained that we're hardly aware of our neighbors. And compared to Manika's community, mine is in chapter 11. And I've made sure I don't need those around me. And I've subtly implied to them that they shouldn't depend on me. As long as I keep my lawn mowed and they keep their teenagers' music down, we have very little reason to interact. But when we are unable to share our true feelings and our needs, instead of creating bridges, we build walls. How tragic. A few years ago, my uh, younger brother died of cancer. And for those who are ready to meet their maker, death's sting is only felt by those of us left behind. And it was painful. And one of my most cathartic experiences was attending Randy's funeral. And several hundred people had gathered together here in Phoenix, most of whom I didn't know. What we had in common was that we all loved Randy, and we were loved by him. He was no vanilla character, but he lived life radically and touching many people on several continents. And I got to represent his four siblings at that service, which gave me a chance to publicly address these strangers and express my true and unreserved affection for Randy. For even in our culture, under certain conditions, intimacy and community are possible even with strangers. And I grieved that I would not see him again that I would never hear his probing questions and his well-informed opinions. But I came home from that funeral to an oblivious neighborhood. Nobody on my street felt my pain. I'd been away. Nobody knew it or cared. They didn't even know I had a brother, let alone that he died. That would be inconceivable in the Middle East where they lived. When his adventurous and faithful life came to an abrupt end, he left behind his wife and three children, three daughters, living in a Muslim country. And there, his death would strengthen the community that was already well established around him, which is precisely what Bonnie found when she went back. Because in the developing world, where they had lived for 20 years, a supporting community had formed around them. 
they had intentionally limited their contact with Westerners and chosen to live in a very poor community with sporadic running water, sending their children to public schools. And in that environment, custom calls for 40 days of grieving, during which time people come in from all over the country and their neighbors and drop by unannounced. And during those six weeks, Bonnie rarely left her apartment. And their friends from all over the country came to extend community. The vast majority of them, Muslims, undeterred by her over Christian faith. And a good friend moved in during that time for those few weeks and put out this guest book. And within three weeks, they had received over 400 visitors. And in her darkest hour, Bonnie experienced this connected, intimate, supportive community practiced by the poor the world over. And I am so much the richer for knowing them. I'm grateful for the affluent community I live in, with the myriad blessings that are mine by virtue of how the cosmic dice landed. However, much that does not glitter is much finer than gold. And the poor are rich where many of us are bankrupt. And thankfully, I don't have to live with guilt knowing that the choice was not mine as to where I was born. But once I acknowledge my poverty, I can profit from their richness and determine to live as a responsible member of our worldwide community. This choice is mine. And I can choose to get to know the people who live next door. And I can borrow something with the anticipation of sharing my, with them. And I can take time to explain the miracle of microfinance and encourage others to join this revolution of ending chronic poverty. Or I can continue down my path of independence deceived by a narrow definition of freedom. And it was about 20 years ago that my wife and I chose to be a part of another important community. And we made our first contribution of $5,000 to become members of the Board of Governors. Because as stated in the governor's brochure, Opportunity International's Board of Governors is a community of people who want to change the world. That's me. I do want to change the world. And it's you too. Otherwise, I doubt you'd be here this weekend. And I'm grateful you are because our relationships will be developed. And through this weekend, our lives will be enriched. While working out at the gym, I saw this slogan on the volleyball team's t-shirt that said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I want to go far. I want to go very far in this objective of eradicating poverty in the world. Thank you.